What what happened to the uh, the Lawfare Ratsek uh, Wintry Minnesota retreat? Oh, I got to work on that. I want a snowshoe with my colleagues. <laughs> The only way to bond. Apparently, the University of Minnesota Rec Center will rent snowshoes. Oh, I love it. I have tried. Have you been cross country skiing since? Have you gotten into that since you've been a, a winter <sighs> haven uh, resident? So I've I've tried to. I grew up on in, in the Northeast, and so I was really into downhill skiing. And then when I moved here, I figured I should try cross country. But the problem is that a I'm very uncoordinated, and b I'm quite lazy. Yeah, cross country skiing is hard. It is hard. It is really hard. It is fun for exactly 20 minutes, and then you're just too exhausted and sore to like go anywhere That's exactly more. right. That's ex- it is really fun for the first 20 minutes. So the best version of this, and I, I think this is not, I think, limited to Minnesota, but I do know that we are one of the world capitals of this sport, is called ski joring, which is where you do cross-country skiing, but you're attached to a dog. So it's a cross between dog sledding and cross country skiing. Like you, you, there are these dogs that train for this, and they're you know they're tied to the waists of their owner slash ski joring partners, and they ski. And Minnesota is one of the stops on the international ski joring Grand Prix tour. So every February, we go and watch the the ski joring. But what's great about it is that the race is designed in such a way that the like real world-class professional teams, which are amazing, right? Both the dogs and the skiers start first, but anyone can actually enter the contest. Because there are eight people who play the sport. <laughs> oh, it's, no, it's no. It's, 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 it's a surprisingly big deal actually here in, in Minnesota. But it's, what's wonderful is, is standing on the finish line because you see you know, the, the real professional teams, which is very impressive. And then progressively – just the more and more amateur pairs until at the end you have these like weekend warrior skiers holding their dachshund under their arm. (laughs) So the requirement is just that you, you are on skis, you the human, and there's a dog present. The dog doesn't need to be like participating in propelling you forward. Well, I think the idea is that the dog is helping pull you, but if you bring your dachshund, which is cute, but not super useful, then about 30 seconds in, the dachshund is done and you have to carry the dachshund. And of course, the the greatest uh, applause comes for the the dachshunds and doodles of various sorts. It's really cute. I did just look up ski jar. Apparently, it's an umbrella term for being pulled by either a dog, a horse, another animal, or a motor vehicle. So that might complicate uh, okay. the rule book. I think – so motor vehicle is clearly that's cheating. That's not in yeah. the spirit of ski joring. A horse is interesting, though. That just sounds straight up dangerous. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's more it's like, like being dragged than pulled. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rational Security. I am one of your co-hosts, Scott R. Anderson, and I'm here with one of my regular co-hosts, Alan Rosenstein. The worst co-host. The worst co-host. <laughs> I think most people agree with that, probably. At least between yeah, the two of us, sad. the worst co-host is here. Well we're, both the, well, we're both the worst hosts. Yeah, we are sadly without the most solid leg of this tripod, Quinta Jurassic, who is on leave this week, but we have pulled in... Two mighty, mighty substitutes for her from our broader Lawfare family. First, Brookings Institution Senior Fellow, Lawfare Senior Editor, Molly Reynolds. Thanks, Scott. It's good to be back. And to join us and round out our quartet, we also have with us Lawfare Managing Editor, Spicy, Tyler McBrien. Tyler, thank you for joining us once again here today. Good to be back. If if Alan is the worst co-host, then I can safely say I'm the worst and only managing editor. <laughs> <laughs> we should do a Patreon, Tyler, just like the worst lawfare people get together. <laughs> We're called <laughs> Bottom of the Barrel. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I don't know if this is the best Patreon perk we've ever come up with, but regardless, <laughs> we are excited to have everyone here today for what we are calling the the sincerest form of flattery edition. Because this week we are dealing with a number of copycats, people who didn't take the clues from some of their predecessors in some particular types of conduct in the national security space, and are perhaps repeating some of the same mistakes in slightly different ways. And we're going to dig into it this week. Topic one for this week, hop in the fence at Lulapalooza. In a clear echo of the January 6th insurrection, followers of former Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro sacked the country's parliament this past week, just days after his successor Lula da Silva was sworn in, and while Bolsonaro himself was visiting former U.S. President Trump at his Mar-a-Lago estate. What's the relationship between January 6th and Brazil's recent experience? Is this the beginning of a dangerous global trend? 
Topic two, the divider house rules. After 15 votes, Representative Kevin McCarthy is now the Speaker of the House. But to get there, he had to make a lot of concessions, many of which are now showing their face in the House rules and in committee appointments, while others still remain secret. What constraints has McCarthy accepted in order to win office, and what will they mean for the coming Congress? And topic three, come on, man. Trying to make that sound as Biden-y as I can. It's hard. It's hard to get that Delaware accent quite right. (laughs) It's Granton accent, Granton by way of Delaware accent. Several months after FBI agents raided former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate to recover a set of classified documents, lawyers for current President Biden have acknowledged that they located a few classified documents, presumably from his time as vice president, in Biden's private office as well. Critics in Congress and elsewhere are crying out that this reflects a double standard, but does it? How big a deal is this, and what might it mean for the ongoing Mar-a-Lago investigation? Alan, let me hand it over to you to get us started on our first topic. So instead of doing a whole long windup before I ask Tyler what's going on in Brazil, I'm just going to ask Tyler. Tyler, you've been following this carefully. What is going on in Brazil? Well, Alan, I'm so glad you asked. As maybe listeners might know, I'm I'm very interested in Brazil. I've I've asked at Brazil Brian on the Lawfare podcast a few times to explain what's happening in Brazil. So I'm not used to being in this position. I'm used to asking questions, but you know, essentially. I think long story short, Brazil had its version of January 6th. As uh, many people have pointed out, the parallels are quite striking. The images, even the date, the sort of the arc of the story in the months leading up, there's been, you know, election denial, you know, fomenting discontent, and then uh, an attack on the seat of government. Uh, In this case in Brazil, it was all three branches of government. Uh, The presidential palace, the Congress, and the Supreme Court building were all broken into um, by pro Bolsonaro rioters. But, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about is to maybe sort of flip the theme of today's episode on its head and to talk about the differences. I think the the similarities have been well commented on and important. There's a lot of utility in in talking about that. And, and, you know, we shouldn't ignore the linkages there. But, you know, there are several, several differences that shouldn't be ignored. And I think, you know, first being that Bolsonaro wasn't there. Uh, he was, uh, as many people may have seen on Twitter and elsewhere, um, thousands of miles away in Orlando, Florida. On the advice of his lawyers, he fled the country. Going to Disney World, obviously. Yes, he's going to Disney World. No, uh, it's even weirder. Uh, he was staying at the house, perhaps still is, um, staying at the house of a former MMA fighter. And I think probably my favorite part of this entire story is that an independent Brazilian newspaper pointed out that one of the bedrooms of the MMA fighter's house is minion themed um which <laughs> i uh point out uh in in a lawfare article this morning that it's very possible that the night of the coup bolsonaro rested his weary head on a minion shaped pillow but <laughs> some of the more important differences i would say uh is that fortunately congressional leaders were also not present uh and so this raises you know questions of you know just what kind of disruption what the the writers were trying to to go for um you know, as, as sort of haphazard as, as January 6th may have seemed, there was somewhat of a unifying goal of, of, of disrupting at least a ceremonial, you know, event, whereas this seemed sort of bent more on just general disruption. And then I think I'll, I'll leave it at one more important difference, which is one thing that Brian Winter pointed out, uh, and that's the allegiance of the police and the military being a lot more uh, murky in this is, in this instance. You know, on January 6th, it was pretty clear, you know, despite some oversights and missteps by law enforcement that, you know, they were upholding the Constitution. Uh, whereas in Brazil's case, uh, it's been noted that a lot of members of law enforcement and the military are, are quite strongly in favor of Bolsonaro, especially among the junior ranks. Uh, and so this poses, I think, a, an even more difficult challenge for Lula in responding, uh, you know, and facing questions of whether or not to you know, purge the security forces, for example, uh, could be, you know, extremely politically fraught. So I would say, you know, well-founded similarities, but it's it's also important to admit that January 8th is not a perfect copycat of January 6th. Just one, one follow-up before we kind of open it up, which is what is the situation, the political situation, or just the situation on the ground in Brazil right now? I mean, are are we dealing with, there was a riot, the riot is over, everyone's tense, but fundamentally the country continues in a politically stable way, or are we teetering at the edge of something that could get out of control very quickly? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'll caveat by saying a country as big as Brazil, it's difficult to 
you know, give a sort of overview of, of what's happening. Some things I've seen um, for people who are there is that another difference I, I, I wanted to point out is that, you know, in the day in the day or two after the riots, there were mass counter protests on the streets of of anti Bolsonaro protesters, you know, condemning the, the insurrection. But then, you know, sort of uh, from the top level, I think there's a, a lot of calls for unity. I believe that Lula is convening all governors of the country to roundly condemn the insurrection. Uh, so it seems, uh, you know, from what I saw today and yesterday, uh, fairly quiet, in fact, in Brazil, which is, you know, seen as a good thing. Tyler, I think your point of framing this as thinking about the differences with January 6th is really useful and really important here. But in some ways, it kind of drives home how much this was an imitation of January 6th, right? Because like a lot of these actions doesn't don't really make strategic sense in the way that at least arguably January 6th did in certain ways. There is no procedural hook here. If they had succeeded in this, it's not clear what would have happened, right? Like Lula was off-site with security forces. He wasn't at real risk. They would have destroyed some property, um, something that's clearly a crime, um, but it's not clear what institutional effect. There wasn't even some sort of very extreme, contrived, constitutionally questionable, but like under a certain squinty light, maybe colorable argument about how they would succeed in retaining power. That's not really in the books here. And so it's so strange. It's so strange Almost like it, it seems almost like the inevitable consequence of a political figure who is so, in the meaning Bolsonaro, who is so consciously framed himself and modeled himself on former President Trump, that perhaps the people who find that appealing, the people who are drawn to that, would similarly feel some instinct to ultimately emulate the actions of former President Trump's followers themselves, even though this doesn't appear to have had the same underlying rationality, the, the way it actually made sense there. It's such an imitation act. And in one that like really Lula and his administration is in, frankly a much stronger position to respond kind of, you know, forcefully uh, and effectively than in a lot of ways, even the Biden administration did. They don't have to wait 14 days to assume office and then warm up. They've already started doing that. And perhaps most importantly, like we should bear in mind, Brazil doesn't have what the United States has in terms of a long history of not prosecuting former presidents uh, or criminally investigating former presidents and senior officials. Like that's very rare in American history. It's not something we've really ever done. Um, I know there've been some investigations of former presidents once or twice in ancient American history, but Lula himself was investigated for corruption uh, and at one point jailed before he was ultimately freed uh, on appeal, if I recall correctly, and then re-entered the political arena, right? Like it doesn't seem to be any of the kind of norm, soft norms or political standards that have made prosecuting former President Trump or those close to him for actions around January 6th so sensitive and something that Attorney General Garland has had to approach so sensitively and so carefully along with the rest of the Justice Department. My sense is that's not really as big an issue with Brazil. So it seems like Bolsonaro has really put himself in a difficult position if and when he ever goes back to Brazil or gets extradited, which is something that I believe Brazil and the United States have an extradition treaty. So it's certainly on the table so long as he remains here. But are we sure that that Bolsonaro did play an active role in in promoting not the conspiracy theory about the you know that whether their election was stolen, right? Which he certainly did, but about this this riot. I, I mean, and this I think connects a little bit to something you were saying, Scott, about you know, isn't it odd that they were doing this without any particular purpose? And I mean, it, it may not be very smart, but I'm not sure how odd it is. I mean, people riot all the time. I mean, people riot for good causes when they're angry. They riot for bad causes when they're angry. I mean, most riots are not instrumental. If anything, January 6th, I think, was the outlier in that there was this set of actual plans, um, which is kind of what made it so scary to begin with. Um, but most riots, they can be very destructive. And again, you know, we can call them riots if we don't like them. We can call them civil unrests if we think they're for a, you know, a good cause. But that generally doesn't have a kind of instrumental logic to it. And it doesn't, again, I, I'm not trying to excuse Bolsonaro here, and it would not surprise me at all if Bolsonaro was behind this. But it, it doesn't seem that far-fetched to me that Bolsonaro ran away from Brazil because he's worried about the crimes he committed while president. And in the meantime, his supporters got really angry because they're really angry. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Yeah, and I think... You rightfully said there are still many unanswered questions of, you know, who bust Bolsonaristas in, et cetera. Uh, but I, I, I agree that this raises a, a question, at least for me, that, you know, what can this tell us about Bolsonaro's relationship with the movement he spawned 
versus Trump's relationship with the movement he spawned. I think, you know, Bolsonaro's absence and relative silence on the eve of these riots maybe suggests that Bolsonarism has outpaced the man himself, whereas perhaps Trumpism is still in lockstep with Trump. I don't know. But it is another, I think, difference that I, I think should be highlighted that could help us make sense of Trumpism versus Bolsonarism. That's a really interesting angle. Like, I, is there a sense, Tyler, as to, you know, what that silence meant? Because at least some accounts I've read have suggested that the silence itself was Bolsonaro consciously eschewing and rejecting existing norms in terms of not participating in the transition of power from Lula. And we did see Trump do the same thing, essentially, you know, in not attending the inauguration of President Biden. But obviously that happened after January 6th and in kind of the aftermath of January 6th and impeachment vote and assorted other things of former President Trump. Is the silence itself, to some degree, a bit of, in this case, substantive speech in terms of rejecting a set of norms, rejecting legitimacy? Or do you have a sense of, of, of the extent to which it's viewed that way among the Brazilian public or of Bolsonaro's own supporters, who I hope they call themselves jareheads personally, but I guess Bolsonaristas is the preferred term, something like this. But regardless, like, is that is the silence itself kind of speech in this context, or is it really genuinely silence? Is it Bolsonaro reflecting neutrality? I get the sense that it's it's much more viewed as damaging in its own way. It's as a, as a, as a sense of speech, as you pointed out, Bolsonaro broke with you know, generations of tradition of of attending the ceremony where he, you know, sort of passed off the presidency to Lula, which is, you know, damaging in itself. So I think, you know, there is a there is a difference in Trump standing on the ellipse saying fight like hell and Bolsonaro being, you know, wandering around a Publix in Orlando, Florida. But that's not to say that he is absolved of any, you know, responsibility in inciting this riot. I, I think as you were hinting at, the silence was damaging in another way. And intentional. You know, one thing, other thing we have to bear in mind here when considering Bolsonaro's actions versus Trump's actions also is the really different legal context around political speech and freedom of expression in the American legal system versus most other legal systems around the world. We have much more robust protections. And there's a reason why Donald Trump can get up and say things that are that provocative, but still have at least at a minimum a colorable argument, if not a strong argument, that it doesn't actually cross the line or something where there is criminal liability. Alan, you've written about this in ways it is possibly on the wrong side of the line, but it's still a question, right? Because the American political norms give huge, huge breadth to political speech. I don't know what Brazil's rules are, but I know most countries don't have those strong protections. So perhaps Bolsonaro is more quietest approach, ways to signal kind of passively or indirectly may reflect the fact that the legal jeopardy kicks in at a lot lower threshold than it does in the American legal system. But that may also mean that smaller things may still have that kind of uh, signaling effect uh, more substantially. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, we really would need a, a Brazilian lawyer here to tell us where the line really is, or a political historian uh, talk about how these things have been viewed in the past. Yeah, it's also interesting to think about that, Scott, in the context of so one of the things that you've seen in sort of the discourse um, in the in the U.S. Um, in the aftermath of what happened in Brazil is sort of people pointing to footage and reports of mass arrests of the individuals who uh, stormed the um, various government buildings in Brazil. You know, having them all rounded up and arrested, and sort of contrasting that with what happened um, in the sort of waning hours of January 6, 2021 itself and January 7th um, in the United States and the way in which we, and then as we've sort of gone through the criminal um, prosecutions of some folks for their participation in um, in the insurrection. I'm obviously not lawfare's criminal prosecutions um, expert uh, here, but there have been uh, sort of you know, criticisms of the response in the U.S. Um, and the processing of those individuals that I think this it's just another um, piece of this, that like the legal system, again, I don't know anything about the Brazilian legal system, but um, it may well be different um, in terms of kind of how easy it is to just arrest people for uh, merely being present or participating in these activities in a way that it may or may not have been in the U.S. So before we close this topic out, I want to continue on Tyler's theme of of flipping the flipping the narrative which is always about you know how can how can this thing abroad be explained through this thing that happened in the United States and, and talk about a kind of another way I think in which 
the events in Brazil might actually affect events in the United States rather than vice versa, which is the interesting question of, of content moderation, right? As we all know, and as, uh, you know, Quint and others like to say, everything is content moderation. Um, and I think there's an interesting, this is another interesting example, because of course, here, just as with January 6th, you had the same sorts of conspiracy theories circulating through social media, which is, you know, popular in Brazil, like it is everywhere else. And, and, you know, I think, it shows that again, the platforms, and again, I'm not even saying this as a critique. I'm, I'm not sure this problem can be fixed, but the platforms have not figured out uh, because I don't think there is a way, frankly, to have open platforms, but be able to clamp down on disinformation sufficiently, frankly. And, and I think that this might actually inform not just what the platforms choose to do in Brazil, but what they choose to do in the United States. You know, Facebook, for example, has to decide this month, I think, whether to allow Trump back on the platform, right? So the, Facebook, along with Twitter, famously threw Trump off after January 6th. The Twitter ban was permanent, though after Elon Musk bought Twitter, he then let Trump back on the platform. The Facebook ban was not actually permanent, or it, it, I'm forgetting the details. Maybe it was permanent, but then the Facebook Supreme Court said that Facebook had to revisit it at some point. I, I think that's actually maybe what happened. Um, and so Facebook has to revisit it. And obviously, you know, Trump is not Bolsonaro and January 6th is not January 8th and all those sorts of things. But I, I do think that this comes at a moment that could, and I think rightly, give Facebook an argument to say, look, you know, um, um, the American political system's not that much more stable than the Brazilian political system. And this stuff keeps happening and we clearly can't fix it. Right? We just don't have the tools to, to stop it. And so we're not going to add to that problem by letting Trump back on. Now, a response to that might be, well, it's not like Bolsonaro was tweeting and Facebooking about all of this, you know, in the last couple of weeks, he was silent, wandering around at Publix in Orlando, as Tyler put it, and this still happens. So maybe the real problem platforms is that you just suck at being platforms. Uh, presumably, that's not what Facebook is going to say. But I think it's just an interesting way to reflect on how all these issues are kind of one seamless web across the world, because fundamentally, we're all the same, including in our stupidity and uh, ability to be bamboozled by conspiracy theories online. Have I stunned you all into silence with the profundity of my musings? I do. I do like it when that happens. I was just, I was trying to think of a, a transition between content moderation and, and uh, this, the house rules. But I, I was stunned into my own silence. <laughs> I was going to say something along the lines of from breaking into parliament in Brazil to breaking up the legislature in the House of Representatives, something like that works, I think. They're both in trouble is what I'm trying to get at. The key point being, let's shift to our second topic uh, <laughs> in regards to the new leadership here in our own House of Representatives. We, of course, saw a pretty dramatic series of events play out in the past week or so, a little more than a week, where we saw 14 ballots on which the Republican House caucus was unable to agree on a candidate for speaker, dragging the process on for several days, the longest such process in the past century, I believe a little longer, more than a century. But on the 15th ballot, we saw Kevin McCarthy, the uh, longtime Republican House leader who has long aspired to the speakership, succeed in securing it, finally flipping the last conservative holdouts to give him the gavel. But to get there, we know we had to make a big set of concessions, and we're only beginning to understand what those concessions are and what they might mean for the House is going to operate in this Congress to come. Molly, you are, of course, our congressional guru, as Ben likes to say. You have been watching these very closely, and we have dragooned you into speaking about them on so many podcasts. Let us do so once again. Bring us up to speed on what we know about the terms of this new Congress. What are the big outstanding points, the big concessions McCarthy had to make? And what will they mean for him actually being able to do the job of speaker now that he's holding the speaker's gavel? Sure. So I think here it's helpful to differentiate between things that McCarthy agreed to, let's say, before January 3rd. And then things that he had to subsequently agree to between January 3rd and January 6th, when he was ultimately elected speaker. Because I think they're 
including from some of the individual Republicans who were holdouts against McCarthy, there's been a little bit of playing fast and loose with what was part of the original agreement that it was in place before vote number one, um, and then what ultimately changed between vote number one and eventually vote number 15, on which he was successful. So some of the things um, that have been discussed were actually agreed to, again, before anyone came to the House floor on January. January 3rd. And those include things like a requirement that each piece of legislation filed in the House deal with, quote unquote, a single subject. I'll note that this um, is probably a pretty easy thing to evade. Like the sponsor of the bill just has to identify what the single subject is. I have um, I have joked, can you just say the subject of this is changing existing law? That sort of thing. So there's a, a fair number of um, there's a fair number of things like that that are you know, concessions that McCarthy had already made. And that also includes um, an agreement to set up a couple of new select either committees or subcommittees. So there is a uh, plans for a full select committee, basically on China, um, to be chaired by Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin, which will sort of look at um, I think that the uh, formal name is something like you know competition with the Chinese Communist Party. Clearly, the House Republican Conference, the Republican Party as a whole has taken a very hawkish turn on China, continued down a hawkish path, uh, what have you. So that's really reflected in this agreement. Um, it was also going into last week, also already agreed to that there would be a select subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee that will investigate what folks are referring to as the weaponization of the federal government. Um, it appears there were a couple of sort of changes to this select subcommittee made over the course of the week, giving it potentially somewhat expanding its jurisdiction. Um, what did not happen um, is it was not moved out of the Judiciary Committee. So that, that was an ask. Um, but as of now, it would remain sort of a select subcommittee under the auspices of the Judiciary Committee, which would give um, Jim Jordan, who's slated to be the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, a fair amount of influence over its um, its direction, especially on subpoenas. So to sort of issue a subpoena, they'd have to go through Jordan. So that's um, that's another thing. A couple of things that did um, appear to uh, have changed over the course of the week sort of between the original agreement and McCarthy's successful vote. One is this is around the what's known as the motion to vacate the chair, which is the mechanism by which um, House members, um, in this case, House members of the Republican conference can try to displace McCarthy if they are unhappy with his performance. And so without spending too much time on this, prior to um, 2015, we didn't really talk about the motion to vacate. It was just not um, not a big feature of the discourse around House procedure. Um, in 2015, it sort of emerged as, uh, in part, thanks to then Representative Mark Meadows, as a, a tool of dissident Republican House members to try and get rid of then Speaker John Boehner. Um, they sort of were threatening to use this tool. Um, John Boehner said, uh, fuck it. I don't know if I can say that on this podcast. <laughs> I basically said he was done. We get, one, we get one F word an episode and you just got it, Molly. Congratulations. <laughs> ben got it last time. Okay. You get it this time. It's like the PG-13 rule. I think John Boehner would be would, would feel that was an appropriate assessment of what he decided in 2015. And so basically that then meant that we did not see an active use of um, the motion uh, to vacate. In 2019, when Democrats took control of the House, they made a change that basically made it harder to use the motion to vacate. Um, and what Republicans have done is basically undone that 2019 change such that now a single rank and file member of the House can raise a question of privileges on the floor of the House to try and depose the Speaker. It is unclear to me how much this will actually matter in practice. So if you were Kevin McCarthy, you were already pretty worried about the idea that some faction of your conference is going to eventually walk on you and your speakership. Um, and there are all kinds of other ways that a faction in the Republican conference could make life really hard. So I think in some ways, it was certainly a big 
symbolic ask of the McCarthy dissidents to get this change, to go back to a single member being able to do this. I'm not actually sure that this change is what's going to facilitate the end of the eventual end of the McCarthy speakership. A couple other things, though, that did change over the course of the week that are pretty important. One of them is around the membership of the House Rules Committee. The House Rules Committee um, basically has quite a lot of power over what actually comes to the floor of the House of Representatives and also the terms for the debate on any individual bill that um, that comes up. For quite a while now, the membership of the House Rules Committee has stood at nine majority party members, four minority party members. The McCarthy dissidents, um, the anti-McCarthy faction, was asking and seems to have gotten, though exactly what this looks like, we'll have to see, a concession from McCarthy that three of the nine Republicans on that committee will be of the House Freedom Caucus or sort of Freedom Caucus adjacent. This basically means that if those three Freedom Caucus types and the four Democrats on that committee want to vote against the terms of debate for any bill that will come to the floor, or frankly, vote against sending a bill to the floor at all. Those three Republicans could sort of have effective veto power over um, over the agenda. It's really unclear to me, one, how aggressive they will be in doing this, um, whether they'll actually use this one, who those three members will be, how open those individuals will be to working with the um, the more McCarthy allied faction on the Rules Committee. But this could be a quite quite a big deal, depending on exactly how it shakes out. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is there do appear to also have been some concessions, or I should say, some sort of specifics around pledges related to the the budget and appropriations process. Again, like these are not, they're not contained in the actual House Rules Package, so we're not entirely clear what they look like. But basically, it seems like McCarthy has, at least for the purposes of the House, has agreed to some pretty a pretty draconian position on discretionary spending. And again, the Senate exists. There's a Democratic president in the White House. The idea that um, we're going to go back in actuality to fiscal year 2022 levels of discretionary spending, which is like the number that's been thrown out there by this faction. That's really unlikely. But the idea that that's the position that the House Republicans are going to take, it does potentially set us up for some real budget brinksmanship, both around the a potential government shutdown and kind of more terrifyingly around the debt limit. So Molly, this all raises for me like a more fundamental question, right? Kind of a strategy question going into this and and a way to think about this moving forward for this Congress, which is how much do these different concessions weaken McCarthy's control? And how much do they, in terms of, I should say, his ability to advance a Republican agenda, but not necessarily, maybe one that would be, be hard to get parts of his flank on, like how much does it injure his control of the Republican caucus and what it can accomplish? And how much do they really kind of empower the conservative faction in a way that's likely to be a big hindrance to uh, Democrats, maybe not just in Congress, but also the Biden administration, Democrats in the Senate? I think the most important or one really important thing to remember here is that the biggest determinant of what happens in the next two years is not going to be these concessions that McCarthy has made, it's the fact that we have divided government and that Republicans control the House and Democrats control the Senate and the White House. And I think my big takeaway from particularly some of this posturing um, around the um, appropriations process and the debt limit is that, you know, my personal assessment of the likelihood of some big showdowns over the course of this next year has gone up. I think that it like that's what the the resolution of the speakership fight has illustrated for me is that, oh, this is where the Republicans are going to stake their flag. That makes the distance that has to be negotiated over between the House and the Senate and the White House even bigger. But at the end of the day, like, we have divided government and it was going to be really hard to get a clean increase to the debt limit a month ago. It's going to be, maybe now it's harder, um, but that's that's the, the way that the needle has moved. For me, I also sort of wonder if some of the kind of particularly some of the smaller things in the rules package that are effectively 
are not especially meaningful under divided government. Some of this is also sort of laying out a position in anticipation of a future period of Republican unified government, whether that's in 2024, um, if there's a change in party control in the Senate and there's a Republican victory in the White House. But that would allow at that point House Republicans to go into unified government saying, okay, we already have these packages. Frankly, the way that the rules of the House work is that the majority of the rules from one Congress end up continuing on to the next Congress. And then there are sort of individual changes. But, you know, going into unified government with a provision of the House rules that says that you need to offset increases to mandatory spending with cuts to mandatory spending, but that that rule doesn't apply to tax cuts. Like that's an advantageous position for Republicans to be in going into unified government if they can sort of put that into the House rules now. You were getting at this in in other ways, but I'm curious what else this vote portends for future votes in this session. Because I I, I heard one analyst on NPR saying that, you know, oh, you thought this vote was hard? That's the easiest vote you're going to see for the rest of the session, which reminded me a lot of, you know, when you when we keep smashing like temperature records and, you know, we're saying, oh, that was the hottest summer on record or the coldest summer for the rest of your life. So I guess, you know, how much more pain are we in for this session? Yeah, I mean, so here again, I think it's helpful to have some good, some like decent expectations about what what was always going to happen in a period of unified government. And so I think like we were not in for an especially robust two years of legislating. It was going to be, like I said, it was going to be hard to raise the debt limit. It's going to be hard to keep the government open. I think what we, the sort of agreements um, and the negotiating position of some of the, the factions within the Republican conference last week suggest that, again, my personal assessment of I think it's going to be harder than I thought it was going to be last week. But I, last week, I thought it was going to be pretty hard. Um, so I think that's what I would take away from this is just this idea that like, oh, there is a faction um, that does appear to be willing to play hardball. We did not see a ton of kind of reciprocal hardball from the more pragmatist um, wing of the House Republican Conference. Um, you know, Brian Fitzpatrick, who's a, a Republican from Pennsylvania, who's sort of often thought of as like the leader of the, or one leader of the more pragmatist wing in the House, you know, was on TV saying, oh, you know, we have the discharge petition available to us on things like the debt limit. We might be able to cooperate with Democrats and sort of go around some of this the more radical faction. That that's true. The discharge petition is really cumbersome. But in general, um, we've just not seen that pragmatist wing kind of use its muscle in the same way that the more radical wing has, or frankly, that the like more moderate wing of the House Democratic Caucus used its influence in the fight to get over whether Pelosi was going to be elected speaker in 2019. Like there are all kinds of differences, obviously, um, structurally between the House Republican Conference and the House Democratic Caucus. But one of them here was that the opposition to McCarthy was coming from the right flank, whereas when Pelosi um, was trying to get elected speaker to um, her opposition was generally coming from her more centrist, more moderate faction. I, I'm curious, Molly, do you do you expect the Republicans to pay any sort of political cost for the last week of absolute chaos? I mean, I know that Kevin McCarthy kept grinning and saying, well, this is actually great for America and it shows how deliberative the House can be and, you know, everything should be done in 15 votes. And obviously that was just him trying to paper over the embarrassment. But I, I you know, I'm just I'm curious whether that will actually stick with voters or if we're all going to forget about this in a week. So I don't necessarily think the sort of messiness of the speakership fight itself um, will matter. I do think that if we get to July and there's a sizable faction of the House Republican Conference that still says we will not bring a measure to increase the debt limit to the floor unless Democrats agree to reduce discretionary federal spending to fiscal year 2022 levels. Like if if some of the things that McCarthy has agreed to kind of keep us on a track towards a real crisis over the debt limit, like that, I think, then I think we start to talk about real political consequences um, and the degree to which, you know, again, if McCarthy follows through on some of the commitments that he appears to have made, House Republicans are going to end up bringing a budget resolution to the floor that calls for enormous cuts to Social Security and Medicare. Um, like that's that's the way you get to a balanced budget in a budget resolution. And like then 
next year, we're just going to see lots and lots of ads that say Republican so and so in, you know, competitive House district voted to cut Medicare like that. I think so. I it's not so much the fight itself, but some of the concessions uh, set us up potentially for an environment where Republicans could pay um, some political cost for having to like go on record subsequently on some pretty unpopular things. Well, and am I right, Molly, that that assumption appears to be the assumption underlying the Democrats' whole strategy to this situation, right? Because part of the reason McCarthy was in the situation he was in is because Democrats were very organized and ensured that their 212, I think it was, votes showed up every time to vote. If they had just allowed people to vote present or not to vote or to just not even show up that day, the overall number McCarthy would have had to win would be lower. So Democrats could have ended this fight between McCarthy and his right wing faction at any point without even affirmatively voting for him as speaker simply by lowering the threshold. But they chose not to. Um, They wanted to drag this fight on. And Ben and I both, I think in our last episode said, well, look, there's probably a certain point where if it looks like the right wing is of the Republican Party is really going to seize power in a way that is really going to make things substantially harder for House Democrats, it makes sense for House Democrats to strike some sort of deal. But instead, they never seemed to see that was the calculus was was ever worth it for them or whatever than reach. But is that just the assumption that these key, the only things they can realistically expect to get out of the House this year, which would be some sort of appropriations and NDAA and hopefully a debt ceiling you know, measure, it was just always going to be such a fight anyway. It's better to make the Republicans force themselves to go further right because that helps electoral prospects what what else could be driving the democratic I think that's part logic? of it i think it's in part part of it is they sort of went into this you know with what I, again i would call appropriate expectations about the possibility of legislating in this year and you know that like you said like the best they can do is to get an increase to the debt limit an omnibus spending bill and an ndaa it's certainly in terms of major legislation and so why make republicans lives easier i also think it's true that while well, like it's fun to imagine what a cross party speaker would look like um, in the House of Representatives. In reality, the concessions that anyone uh, who was trying to seek cross-party support would have to make to start getting Democrats on board, the size of those concessions would start losing not just the folks in the Republican conference who weren't voting for McCarthy, but other folks in the House Republican conference who were supportive of McCarthy. So unlike you know, what we've seen happen in a couple of state legislatures where we've seen some interesting coalitions around um, electing speakers in the past couple of weeks. I just don't think that's plausible given the distance between the parties uh, in the House of Representatives. And then the last thing I'll say has to do again, I think, with the po- the internal politics of the House Democratic Caucus, which is so we just saw a major leadership transition in the House Democratic Caucus from sort of Pelosi and Steny Hoyer to what they're calling the new three. So, um, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, House Democratic Whip um, Catherine Clark, and then um, Pete Aguilar, who is the Democratic Caucus Chair. And I think there's there was some sense that like we want to make sure that our new leaders are going into this with the unity of the party. So you saw things like even Jared Golden, um, who's a Democrat from Maine, who represents like a pretty Trumpy district, like, and has never voted for a Democrat for speaker before. He's either, I think, voted present or um, voted for someone else. Like he voted for Hakeem Jeffries vote after vote after vote. And so I think part of it is just also a reflection of Democrats wanting for themselves to have a sense of unity going into the modern minority going into this new um, this new period, and also then these pieces about the differences between Democrats and Republicans. So I, I do, I take all that on board, but I still want to push it back on it a bit on the simple, simple logic, right? Like if, for example, let's say the three, you know, Freedom Caucus seats on the Rules Committee, right, which was, I think, a pretty late concession, if I recall, like a 13th, 14th, 15th ballot concession somewhere late in the process, maybe not quite that late. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but just say hypothetically, it was the, you know, on the 13th ballot, right? And, you know, Democrats had 10 ballots of clean votes for Jeffries, clean unified votes, clear, solid party control. Why wouldn't it make sense for Jeffries to say, all right, no Democrats show up this time? McCarthy can have the gavel, but we're not going to throw any more meat to the Freedom Caucus to get any more of these concessions, 
unless they actually do think it's in the political interest of Democrats in the House for the Freedom Caucus to be able to run the Republican caucus and push it that far right, even if it's a messy ceiling over messy fight or messier fight even than we would have had otherwise over debt ceiling, over appropriations. You know, it just strikes me that they're really putting a bet on where these Freedom Caucus tactics and politics go politically, but it's a pretty big bet in my mind, because it ultimately in the end, I think they kind of helped contribute to the victory of those people to the extent they had one. Yeah. So I guess I'll again I'll say couple of things. So one, to correct something I said in my last response, it's not that Jared Golden had never voted for a Democrat. It's that he had never voted for Pelosi for Speaker. But um, a couple of things. So one, I don't want us to there's a little bit of a, I think, a, a trap um, in thinking about the Democrats versus the Republicans, where we think about, oh, sometimes folks sort of say Republicans' worst be- behavior is always somehow Democrats' fault. Um, and I don't, I don't sort of want us to go there. So I like, I think it's while yes, Democrats could have said um, at any point, like, we're just not going to show up and that will get um, McCarthy a victory. I just don't think it was in their political or their assessment is that like, it was not in their political interest to do that. And, you know, in the case, and again, thinking about sort of the, the rules committee, in some ways, some of the like, if the choice is something doesn't something Republicans generally want to vote for doesn't come to the floor at all because it's not palatable to the most hardline Republicans. Like that's also fine with Democrats. They, there are like, there's a reason Democrats will vote to not send Republican bills to the floor. Like they, that's, that's also sort of an exercise in, um, in partisanship. And so, yes, they could have eventually uh, said like, we're tired of doing this, but like there was no indication that they were there. They had said uh, House Democratic leaders had told all of their members that they needed to, they should expect to stay in town until they picked a speaker. And so like, if it was going to go through the weekend, they were all going to be here and no one wanted to do that, but they, um, they were sort of sufficiently unified and you really didn't hear too much discussion of people saying, eh, maybe I'm not going to show up. From papering over problems in the House to problems stemming from paper. Let's talk about what I am so not excited to talk about, but we will be talking about for a while, which is the classified document scandal comes for Joe Biden. It comes for us all, really. Uh, It's just inevitable that we are all at some point going to have classified documents found at our residences or think tanks. Uh, So... Last night, which is to say Monday night, uh, the White House announced that a, quote, small number of classified documents were found at the offices of President Biden's former think tank as Biden's lawyers were packing his offices up. Uh, The documents, and I think important to get the timing right, the documents were discovered two months ago, so I think about a week before the midterms, at which point the White House immediately notified the National Archives, who then picked up the documents the next day. And they also immediately notified the Department of Justice, uh, which uh, then, well, the Attorney General Meyer Garland then directed John Lausch Jr., who's the U.S. Attorney for Chicago and who was appointed by Trump. Garland directed Lausch to investigate and determine whether or not a special counsel should ultimately be appointed. Uh, So the special counsel regulations provide for this kind of pre-special counsel investigation to decide whether there should be a special counsel. Uh, And that apparently uh, process is still uh, ongoing. And so obviously we're going to get into this whole question of what does this mean for the uh, other classified documents, investigation of President Trump and and Mar-a-Lago. But before we get into that, let me ask, and I'll I'll start with Scott, why why does this keep happening? (laughs) Right? It's just, it's kind of remarkable that the last three presidential candidates, right, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, and Hillary Clinton, all have had classified document retention issues. Why are we so bad at this? And just putting aside criminal prosecutions, how do we stop this from happening? Because I don't know about you, I am so sick of talking about documents, right? Whether it's like Biden's documents or Clinton's documents. I don't even want to talk about Trump's documents because I think that's like a deeply uninteresting way of getting at Trump's illegality. And yet all we do is talk about classified documents. Scott, fix it. Yeah. Well, so let's first talk about why this keeps happening. And then let's talk about the illegality element of it. Because I think they're two very different stories, right? And it's very important to bear in mind why they're so different. You know, the holding of these documents keeps happening because A, A, 
we have a classification system that wildly overclassifies everything. If you've ever worked in government, particularly in the foreign affairs space, a huge amount of information is processed on classified systems, including classified documents. A lot of that information isn't necessarily classified or wouldn't doesn't have to be classified, but it's put on the classified system in part because sometimes documents are seeing it has more credibility because they're on the classified system. It gets access to kind of sort of more elite policymaking audiences that often look at things on the high side with more scrutiny and with more attention. Like these are all literal things I have talked to senior policymakers about and have had them say, well, yeah, we could do this on the low side, the unclassified system. Let's put it on the high side. People will get more eyes on it at the White House and other places. And I am not exaggerating. This is actual logic. And it's true. They're right. They're doing engaging in strategic bureaucratic behavior. But because of all of these factors, you it's really hard to avoid classified information when you are working in a foreign affairs space or you know even part-time like the president does or other senior officials do. And you are dealing with this information that's essential to that work, even as you're trying to juggle other duties. So if you're the Secretary of State like Hillary Clinton, you're traveling all over the world. You're traveling in a lot of places where there's not always you know, easy to get classified information. If you're the president, you're engaging in political tasks. You're engaging in all of these other sorts of activities and other sorts of documents where classified information often intermingles in terms of meetings, preparation, documents, binders. So it's not surprising to me that you would see some of these classified records, uh, if they're particularly if they're in kind of hard copy printed format, end up in boxes of documents that are boxed up by NARA at the end of an administration and shipped away, right? An added complication to this, frankly, is the fact that most of the people involved in this are older and they like to work on paper. That sounds stupid, but it's very real. Anybody, I mean, I think I don't have to tell people on the podcast, if you're dealing with somebody who worked over the age of 50 or 60, they probably prefer to read things on paper and not on a screen. And that creates a lot more classified records that are easy to mishandle and just distribute. And then you have the fact that these are all senior officials, so subordinates do what they say. And if they say, hey, print this out for me, put it in my folder when I go home, they get away with it. And if people notice that, frankly, they may have accidentally put a classified record into someplace they shouldn't, they probably will get away with it too. And they're not going to get reported in a way that lower level people can't get away with. And if they get caught, have major career consequences. That's not true for senior political people. So there's a lot of factors that go into this sort of behavior. What I will say is that I'm not surprised by it when it happens at a limited scale. A certain point, a very large scale, I think really becomes a problem. But at a limited scale, I would be shocked if it doesn't happen at least a few times to senior officials in almost every administration of every political party. Um, it's often not malicious. It's not a, often, I would guess, not even really intended to in any way sort of violate protocol. Like a lot of the Hillary emails were really, you know, an effort to communicate information from one system to another without thinking about, in all, all cases, whether it was classified. But it's not clear it was trying to avoid it as much as it was just trying to quickly address a policy scenario without fully contemplating the implications of, you know, relaying certain facts and information on one system or another. And so, you know, it's a problem. It's something that should be addressed. I think in particular, it's a problem because lower ranked people and career people, again, have can have careers ended over this. Um, in some cases, might even face criminal prosecution over behavior that doesn't look substantially that different from this. And so it's pretty unfair for senior people to get that and that better effort should be made. But I don't know if it's, you know, condemnable or not understandable, um, particularly, frankly, for White House officials who are often working in spaces where classified information can be handled much more broadly than other officials where classified information is often kept to a skiff, at least of the highest order. But this all makes it very different from the Trump case and the reason why I think efforts to conflate these two are really misplaced. Though clearly these efforts are going to be all anyone on the right is going to talk about for the next oh, forever. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we are now not going to be able to talk about the Mar-a-Lago Mar investigation without having people reference these Biden documents. And it's a huge faux pas. It's unfortunate that it happened. It's pretty stupid and frustrating, I think, for people who have come to bat, as I have and other folks on this podcast have, for the legitimacy of the Mar-a-Lago investigation, the reason it's a real concern. But they're very distinguishable. Donald Trump keeping the classified records was not in itself the problem or even illegal. It's when the National Archives requested the records back and former President Trump and his staff refused to provide them. And then when the Justice Department issued a subpoena for them and they provided some but not all of them and then most notably signed off on records asserting, oh yeah, we gave you all of them. That's what triggered the search warrant. It's the lying about it that's illegal. 
It's the refusing to return records that once you realize you have them in your custody and they are requested by federal officials, that's what's illegal. And actually, if you go down to the criminal charges that are included on the search warrant for the FBI, that's actually the criminality that's being focused on. It's not just the possession of the records. It's how they're being mishandled and used knowingly. Those wouldn't apply if this is really a case where these records were held accidentally by President Biden while he was former vice president. And it's not something that clearly extends to most of the cases for Hillary Clinton, but it's a real problem for former President Trump. And so they're very distinguishable. But again, that's going to get lost in the messaging mess that we're about to live through over the next several months as the Mar-a-Lago investigation proceeds. But isn't the messaging mess like 90% of it in this case? I mean, this is always what has struck me as somewhat frustrating about the Mar-a-Lago investigation, which again, is not that it's somehow illegitimate or that what Trump did is not a big deal, but that for better or for worse, if you are going to indict the former president and current Republican nominee on these charges, right, it's just a fact that it is not enough that they be legally sufficient, right? In, in this context, you just have to take into account the the politics of it. And I, I just really wonder, again, agreeing with everything you said, right, because it's correct that these are not comparable situations. I mean, is 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 a prosecution of Donald Trump viable? as a matter of where we are in America in 2023 politically, given that you're just going to hear an endless stream of hashtag, but his papers, right? From now until the heat death of the universe. You know, my perspective on this, Alan, I, I think you and I may actually foundationally disagree with this to some extent, but my view of this is always that because, precisely because you are prosecuting a former president and it is so politically sensitive, you are going to pursue the charges where you have the absolute strongest evidence. And the Mar-a-Lago case, even more than January 6th, even more than a lot of other items, is the case where you have the strongest smoking gun case against former President Trump because of his personal involvement in lying to the FBI after clearly being confronted by National Archives and other federal authorities multiple times about these records. And so that's why I still think it's very likely you will see charges from this. And it is distinguishable. But again, the, the messaging, I don't think is everything, but it's going to messy up the politics of it, certainly to some degree. Yeah. And I think thinking about the politics kind of moving beyond the question of Trump's potential criminal prosecution. Um, and if we were talking before about how everything is content moderation, um, everything is Congress, you know, one of the things, again, that we knew before the experience of last week is that the House Republican Conference was going to take a really aggressive oversight posture in the direction of the Biden administration. We sort of expected that this would include an investigation into Hunter Biden. Um, and now I think, to me at least, this just represents yet another thing that we're going to see a kind of big showy um, house investigation of even if as Scott, I think really excellently explained, you know, there are malicious and unmalicious versions of this, there's the lying about it. And then there's the, you know, we found these documents in a closet, a friend of mine who um, runs um, an legislative archives, you know, tweeted about this the other day that like, it's not unusual to find classified material in an archive when you're processing records. It's what you do next that is the big question. Um, and so all of that being said, I just do, I think this is you know, going to be more grist for the mill that is the House Republicans oversight operation. I guess I've been a bit quiet during this segment because I've been trying to overcome the the wave of malaise that washed over me when I saw this story come out, um, which it sounds like is shared by uh, at least Alan. Ugh, it's just, but, I'm, it you're, just you were trying to fight, you fight the instinct to scream, lock him up, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know me. But it, you know, in trying to look at some sort of silver lining or perhaps bright side, is there any way way that this might play? In, in favor of, of the DOJ. So, you know, in, you know, sort of setting aside the facts of, of the differences in the cases, is there any way that this might play toward a perception of even handedness by, by DOJ saying, you know, we're not just targeting Trump here, you know, any occurrence of, you know, classified information, you know, found in any president's closet, uh, former president or current president will investigate. Am I being too hopeful there? That's an, inter that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I do think you're being a little too hopeful for for a number of reasons. I mean, first, I think that, look, let, let's assume that the story is what it sounds like it is, which is fairly straightforward, though 
one thing that is not so straightforward is why it took us two months to learn this. And we should talk about that before we, before we break. But let's assume this story is fairly straightforward. And it turns out that like someone screwed up and this happens and they did everything that's right. And like, there's no, there's no there, there really. Right. I, I think that because at most you're going to have a special counsel rather than an independent counsel, which is to say that ultimately it is going to be Merrick Garland's call. When he says my boss didn't do anything wrong. It's just not, it's it, like, your boss probably didn't do anything wrong, but unfortunately, I don't think it's going to have the effect that we necessarily want it to have. I mean, I think if DOJ indicts Hunter Biden, which is, of course, unrelated, and they should not do it for political reasons, they should do it if they should do it, right, depending on the facts, like that will uh, send a signal of real DOJ independence. But of course, that doesn't help Joe Biden, either politically or personally, right, in, in the sense of that this is his son. So I, I just don't think that the infrastructure of independence is there to really help DOJ. And and I think, I mean, look, I, I know no one thinks independent councils are, independent councils are out of fashion, you know, both constitutionally and I think policy-wise, but like, <laughs> there's a reason that we came up with one. The special counsel is just, it's kind of weak sauce, ultimately, when things like this happen, unfortunately. And it's by, weak sauce by design. Okay, I hear you, Alan. I'm, I'm going back under my cloud of malaise. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I don't disagree with, with Alan on that. I, I would say, I don't think even when the independent counsel statute was still in the books, this would have been remotely serious enough to even warrant one, in all honesty. This sort of thing is pretty routine and happens regularly. It's notable here because of the political context. And I agree the timing is a little awkward, which I, we should get to in a second. I do want to, I do want to address that. I will say here, you know, we know that Attorney General Garland asked a holdover U.S. attorney, I think from the Northern District of Illinois, if I'm recalling correctly. So not somebody who would otherwise have jurisdiction, but because he was a holdover Trump appointee to look into this, maybe, maybe, you know, there's an argument to me that he should have just for the sake of parity appointed that person as a special counsel, in which case they would be doing basically the exact same thing because the special counsel doesn't do a lot. I mean, it would just kind of sets up some procedures about reporting and things like that and maybe insulate a little bit bureaucratically. So there's some argument for that. And look, at a certain point, as I've said before in regards to the Hunter Biden case, there might be a good case for the Biden administration to say, yeah, okay, if there's going to be real serious things, let's give it to a special counsel because we're not worried about coming out the wrong end of this because their legal exposure is actually pretty limited. The worst part of this in some ways is the narratives that can be spun around it and committing it to a, you know, often fairly black box investigatory process can be a good, you know, response point to some of this stuff. We might get there. Remember, that's not that's not uncommon. That's actually a way that the special counsel regulations were always envisioned to be used as a tool for the administration, not just against the income administration. The timing point's a really good one. And I think you're going to see a lot more heat around this that's going to look more credible um, because all of this happened right before the midterm elections and has not come out now until after not just the midterm elections, but the appointment of the new Congress. I don't know why it's coming out now specifically. I think that's a fair question. It's worth noting, though, that the Justice Department is not the one who outed the Mar-a-Lago investigation. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. They engaged with the Trump administration very quietly for many, many, many months until the FBI raid. And even then, the FBI raid became such public information because former President Trump announced it and objected to it in social media and elsewhere and was picked up by the uh, kind of conservative media. It probably would have been picked up or very well might have been picked up by conventional media anyway and certainly would have been a story. But they didn't get wind of the story for a very long time after much more involved activities by the executive branch. So again, I don't think there actually is a double standard here in keeping this quiet. Uh, maybe you can argue maybe the Biden administration should have been more forthcoming earlier, but then you can make the same criticism of former President Trump. So, so, I, but again, it doesn't prevent. It's not going to prevent people from spinning this into a much more uh, damaging political narrative. I mean, just on on the timing issue. I mean, am I right that this would fall under the? I forget if it's the sixty day rule or the ninety day rule. It's the you know right the the, the DOJ policy against making statements into ongoing activities that could affect a, an election. Wouldn't this have fallen into that? I mean, again, right? I, I'm. I, you know, who knows if that's a good policy or not, right? Because it's not great when these things come out after elections. Um, but to the extent that that policy exists, d does what, doesn't this fall under it? Or does that only apply if the candidate is actually running, right? And here, obviously, Joe Biden is not is not running. Exactly. My although I'm not you know a, a, an expert in this, but my understanding of the policy is that the the most technical framing of the policy is that it's about candidates and announcing major investigatory or prosecutorial steps, but that said, 
Obviously, there's an underlying logic here that can apply elsewhere, and these are all discretionary steps. And generally, the Justice Department, for very well-founded reasons, does not go around announcing investigatory steps before they've reached a conclusion anybody's done something illegal because it leads to all sorts of public inferences that can really harm people uh, and individuals when, in fact, there may not be any legal conclusion to support that. So again, I think silence on the part of the Justice Department is totally appropriate. You can argue maybe former President or pardon me, President Biden, former Vice President Biden should have said something of his own initiative. But again, I again that same criticism can be made of other people in similar positions. And again, I don't think this is actually serious enough to warrant that strong response, but you're going to hear that. Inevitably, it's just going to be part of how people spin this. Well, folks, we're going to have to leave our conversation there for now, but this would not be rational security if we did not fill your ear holes with some object lessons to hold with you for the week don't to come. Don't say ear holes. Before, don't say ear holes. Before we can. Nope, don't like You're that. an ear hole, Alan. <laughs> Screw you. No. Uh, <laughs> nice. For, for, well done. Touche. To, ponder on over the week to come until we are back in your podcatcher. Alan, what do you have for us this week? So for your ear holes, I have the latest thing that's going to go into my mouth hole. You're welcome, Scott. <laughs> Poor Molly. <laughs> Molly's like, I'm what out. You done? I'm out. <laughs> what have you done? This is all more. Scott's fault. No more holes. So what is going into my mouth hole this evening is uh, one of the best soups, green pozole. Uh, it is soup season in, well, everywhere in the winter time, but especially in Minnesota, where it's very cold right now. And I'm kind of doing a soup a week. That's my thing. And pozole, which is the uh, delicious Mexican soup slash stew, usually made with chicken or pork, uh, thickened with chilies. Uh, and in the you know, in case of green pozole, green chilies and tomatillos, and then uh, a bunch of hominy as well, which is the, the big, the big corn, the big nixtamalized corn kernels. Uh, that is currently in my oven. It smells so good in my house. I am so excited to eat this. And so that's my object lesson with a, a great recipe that I'm going to link to, which is a very clever, very, very clever use of cilantro as natural green food coloring. But I'm going to leave you in suspense. You should watch the video. I, I have to admit, Alan, you have me very curious because I have tried to make uh, hominy before, including in green pozole and versions of green chili. Because I'm a vegetarian. It seems like something I should like. It's just another kind of yeah. starchy thing to fill myself it's up with. It's kind of chewy. It has like a good mouthfeel to it. I guess. I've never been able to make it work. But I feel like I should owe, my, owe it to myself to give it one more try because I have so many people kind of sing its praises to me. And I do really like Rick Martinez, whose recipe I think this is that you're, yeah, for Bon Appetit, who yeah. does awesome yeah. stuff uh, in Mexican cooking. So I, I'm going to give it another try on your suggestion. But if it doesn't work, I'm shipping it straight to your house, and you have to eat That's it. That's right. Because I'm to my mouth this. hole. Um, to your mouth hole. This, you should watch. You should watch the All video. All these holes. What is this? A Shia LaBeouf oh, no. vehicle? Come oh, on! Oh my god! What? I don't, I don't know. Classic where film. Going. That oh, was boy. an extremely deep cut, Scott. <laughs> Very deep cut. A classic movie. Shia LaBeouf. Wait, what movie? I think it's film premiere. The movie Holes. Oh yeah. With Sigourney Weaver, too. And I think some yeah, other famous people. Yeah, I don't before it was a movie with Shia LaBeouf. I'm, I, I'm Shia before literature. That's what I always say. <laughs> Shia LaBeouf vehicle for me, always. Well, for my object lesson this week, despite what I just said about literature and books, uh, I'm endorsing a book. Um, a book that's been out for a very long time uh, that I actually read in college. And I don't think I really processed it at the time. And then I picked up uh, the, the author's more recent book, um, the free world recently on a, on a friend's recommendation and started reading it and was enjoying it and was like, but found myself kept thinking, man, I really wish I remembered better his prior book. And that is the metaphysical club. This won the Pulitzer prize in 2002 or 2003, I think when I was in college, I read it way back when I know I did. Cause I found like a very heavily leafed beaten up copy of it at my parents' house after I'd ordered a new one on Amazon, assuming that I no longer had that college copy. And I finally had opportunity over the holidays and during a recent trip to pick it up. It is a very dense book that requires consolidated like time to read, um, which is part of the reason I started reading a while ago, set it aside and just picked it back up. But it is just a phenomenal read, like a really, really intensely personal intellectual history that ties the personal history and historical context of all these figures in 
pragmatism, kind of like, you know, the, the leading American philosophical movement of the kind of post-Civil War era into the early 20th century and ties them all together in a fantastic way. I'm only about two thirds of the way through on this reread, but I just loved it. And while suffering on some major late night jet lag uh, in my hotel room on a recent trip to Europe, uh, I had several hours to myself uh, where I tried to read it, put myself to sleep and instead found myself reading for two or three hours at a time in a way I've not had the luxury to do for a long time and really enjoying it. So encourage folks to check this out. It's a metaphysical club by Louis Menon. And I really enjoyed his most recent book, um, The Free World, that I strongly recommend folks check out. I am going to turn back to it as soon as I finish this one. A similar intellectual history of the Cold War era. Yeah. So I, I will plus one the, the metaphysical club as one of sort of the best intellectual histories ever written. It is interesting, though, and I think it's something I did not appreciate when I first read it. It is actually a deeply subversive and quite dark book because, in a sense, without getting a whole discussion of it, like the main thesis is that pragmatism's, you know, instrumental de-emphasis on objective truth comes from the fact that all these Northerners, like Oliver Wendell Holmes, had a horrible traumatic experience in the Civil War. And from that, they decided that no cause could ever justify that, which is an obvious tension with how I think we view the Civil War today, which was a righteous war against slavery. And so there's this, there's this deep kind of ambivalence about pragmatism on the one hand being this uniquely American contribution to world thought. And on the other hand, sitting very uneasily with what we might think of as sort of the most important moral achievement of the mid 19th century, which was the end of slavery, which of course required this bloody war to achieve. And I think that's something that when the book first came out was not really sufficiently appreciated, but it is, it, it, I don't know. I've, I've, that's always stuck with me. Um, since rereading that's a it. great, I think that's actually a great way to describe like certainly at least one of the main theses throughout the book. And I will say, I find it incredibly refreshing to, in an era of extremes, at least in rhetoric, to like read a book that celebrates pragmatism and moderation as kind of a premier American virtue in intellectual tradition is part of the reason I think I'm really enjoying it now in ways that I probably did not in college when I was a real radical myself, with my hippie hair. Um, Molly, what do you have for us for this week's well, episode? I feel like a little bit of a dilettante going back to something that's cooking related. You're just doing my job for me, Molly. Don't worry about it. Throw a cocktail in there. You got it all covered. <laughs> Molly, what are you planning to put in your mouth hole? <laughs> well, um, I have a new favorite cookbook. <laughs> it is called Dinner in One by Melissa Clark of sort of New York Times food fame. Uh, the whole premise is that all of the recipes, uh, you cook them in one dish. So someone who loves to cook and uh, hates washing dishes. Uh, this is a real attracting, uh, attracting thing to me. But the real reason I want to tell everyone about this cookbook is not just because it has produced several delightful meals, but because I like everyone else who wanted this cookbook, was forced to wait extra time to receive it. It was originally supposed to be a birthday present to me from my husband. Instead, it came as a Christmas gift. And that is because in early 2022, uh, an entire shipping container containing all of the copies of this book fell off of a uh, boat uh, when they were en route from uh, Southeast Asia to the United States, delaying publication of the book. This is so here I have brought um, my interest in low dishes production recipes and our collective interest in the global supply chain together. Uh, we'll put, uh, I think, a story about um, this. It happened to both this cookbook and another sort of anticipated cookbook from uh, someone who owns a restaurant in New Orleans. Um, I will put a story about that in the in the show notes. But this is a reminder of, uh, again, the, the way in which the global supply chain uh, comes into all of our lives. Wow, Melissa Clark did not deserve that. No one deserved that. Nobody should do that. To me. Nobody puts <laughs> Melissa in a corner. No, <laughs> and really, no, no one deserves to have to be called by their editor to say your book is coming out several months later than planned because all of the extant copies fell off of a ship when they were en route to New York. I have to say, I've had a copy of this book for several months, so I must have been a very early adopter before the before the uh, cruise ship uh, or the container ship. No, I believe, ship I believe the delay meant that it came out in September, um, as opposed to sometime earlier in the year. I have a June birthday, ah, so I was. I see um, was, that makes sense. It was supposed to, I think, come out in like March 2022. It came out in September instead, which meant that we missed my birthday, and instead, I waited until Christmas to get my copy as a gift. 
I'm annoyed by how much I love Melissa Clark and her recipes and how charming I find her. I feel like I shouldn't, and I find it like too basic, but I buy all her cookbooks and find them very useful and uh, I'm always frustrated by how much I love them. And this one's no exception. And it is very useful. I mean, I feel, I feel like, I feel like this is, again, we've had conversations about the elder millennial nature of um, this podcast before. I feel like this is another place where this is uh, coming out in full force. That is very much so. Very much so. All right, Tyler, as our more junior millennial, bring us bring us home with some new fresh flavor. Make it spicy. Load what do you got? Well, I have a, somewhat of a TV recommendation, but Alan, I refuse to say eye holes, so I won't do that. <laughs> um, but uh, and, and, and Scott, as as a as a TV buff, um, you're going to hate what I'm about to say. But I just finished season three of Emily in Paris, which is not my object lesson. Don't worry. Boo. My object lesson is in reference to Emily in Paris. That show um, is a crime against humanity. Just wait. I'm I, so uh, my object lesson is actually a, a New Yorker article from November 2020 by Kyle Chaka, who I believe coined the concept or the name ambient TV, which I think has been very useful in me working through my shameful enjoyment of Emily in Paris seasons one through three. And so he he sort of borrows the concept from. Brian Eno's ambient music, something that can be igno- like ignorable yet interesting that, you know, is sort of soothing on in the background. You can easily, you know, tune in and out of Emily in Paris in um, it's just in defense of ambient TV is probably what I'll what I'll end with. And also, I'll say if, you know, if listener, if if Scott's object lesson was a little too highbrow, I hope I brought it home with uh, with Emily in Paris season three and ambient TV. I will say, I think this concept of ambient TV reflects the divide between elder and junior millennials <laughs> because junior millennials never had to live through the days where you just had one DVD box set while you were in graduate school, desperately trying to plow through some miserable paper and just playing <laughs> The Office season three, DVD by DVD in the background, which is how I got through law school more or less. So, you know, I'm very familiar with the idea of ambient TV, uh, but I feel like with Netflix, there's too many selections now, too many options. Exactly. Um, I don't know if this is one upping you or one whatever the reverse of that is. Um, I will say that I'm um, in graduate school. I watched beginning with episode one and going through whatever the last episode of is of the television show Monk on DVD from the public <laughs> library in Ann Arbor, Michigan. All of the episodes from the beginning to the end, which again, as uh, as I think Scott has just revealed, does uh, reflect some intragenerational divide among us. Tony Tony Shalhoub Indeed. is the best. As a younger millennial, I'm still not you know too young to to know the joys of the ambient DVD menu and falling asleep to that as it just plays on loop. Oh yeah, maybe oh, we yeah. should bring that back too. <laughs> oh yeah, I love it. Oh man, I'm having flashbacks. I'm gonna have to dust off that DVD player I have <laughs> rotting in a corner of my basement, <laughs> along with my stack of DVDs. But until then, folks, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Rational Security is a production of Lawfare. So follow us on Twitter at RATL Security and be sure to leave a rating or review wherever you might be listening. While you're at it, visit lawfareblog.com for our show page with links and past episodes of the podcast for our written work and the written work of other Lawfare contributors and for information on Lawfare's other phenomenal podcast series. And be sure to sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon for an ad-free version of this podcast, among many other special benefits. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan. We are once again edited by the wonderful Jen Patcha Howell. On behalf of my co-host Alan and our special guests, Molly Reynolds and Tyler McBrien, I am Scott R. Anderson, and we will talk to you next week. Till then, goodbye.